Secretary? Member of the Academy, uh, Steve Correll, suggested that possibly what we could do as Academy members is to make a list of at least 10 dentists who we know who might be interested in learning about IAOMT. And then send that list, name and addresses, to me. Now, I could give you my address, email, fax number, but what I would like to do, Jess Clifford is going to put it on a cellophane, and towards the end of the lecture with Boyd Haley, we'll put it up here so that you can copy it. Ask yourself the question, if they don't get it here, where will they get it? Now think a minute what I just said. If they don't learn about mercury toxicity, about NICOs, about the things that really can make a difference with their patients, because we're all patient oriented, where are they gonna get it? We have to be missionaries. We have to be enough concerned about our patients, as Murray Vimy said, that this message gets out everywhere. Think about that, list your 10 names, and send them to me, thank you. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Wayne Obi, uh, this is, we wanted to give you a very brief update about the uh, lawsuit up in Canada. So uh, Wayne's going to come up and give about a, one or two minutes just to give us a quick overview of what's gone on. So Wayne, if you will. Thank you. The Canadian class action lawsuit is alive and well. Um, we expect to be in court in November and have the lawsuit certified at that time. Right now, uh, the lawyers have been instructed by Justice Sharp to start immediate meetings um, with the other attorneys to make sure that all of the motions and all of the arguments that they're going to bring up are out of the way and it's not a circus when we start. So we gave you a newsletter and it updates you fully on the class action lawsuit. So if you want to go over that, it tells you pretty much, pretty much everything that's going on. Now there's been rumors about there being an American similar class action lawsuit, and uh, the rumors are true. What, what in fact has happened is over the past year, there's been all kinds of lawyers um, coming to us, most of them ambulance chasers, trying to get something going down here. Uh, a lawsuit um, we expect will be filed sometime this fall, probably close to Christmas time. Um, there's a large uh, law firm that is financing the entire operation and we'll be working with Swankin and Turner and John Brown, Charlie Brown and uh, James Love and all the people that know this issue inside out down here. So um, what you might be able to do for us in that regard is we're looking for representative plaintiffs. That's good victims of mercury poisoning in the United States. Uh, there's an 800 number on our brochure. Feel free to call us, have your patients call us. Uh, we're starting to do interviews of the potential representative plaintiffs within the next few weeks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. Okay, I'd like to invite Boyd Haley back up and uh, he'll do part two of the presentation. Wayne? Or uh, Boyd? Yep, it's on. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're going to take kind of a, a, a switch now. When I presented, started presenting this data to a lot of different people, uh, at one meeting I was invited to give a, a seminar to the Dams Association, and on that speaker's forum with me was a, a fellow by the name of George Mining who was uh, giving a lecture on root canals and how toxic that they were and how bad they were. And he's, a, he's quite a remarkable, uh, nice, he reminds me of my granddad, you know, and I went up talking to him, but I thought, he's got to be a little bit mercury toxic, you know, <laughs> to believe this. But he, uh, and, and I want to give credit where credit is really due, you know, along with Hal Huggins, who's the most persistent person in the world, this fellow whom I didn't know kept calling me and saying, well, if you think mercury's toxic, you should test root canal teeth. 
and I'll send you some, and I'll send you some. And I, uh, uh, he, he wore me down mentally to where I agreed I would check some of the teeth that he sent. And he sent the teeth to us. We tested them. We didn't test them. I couldn't find any student in my research group that wanted to do it because it seemed too ridiculous. It seemed like you know, a real wild flyer, and I wasn't real excited about it either. And I probably gave off that body language when I was trying to talk people into doing it. And finally, Kirk Pendergrass said, Boyd, because he said, I'm feeling sorry for you, and uh, get this guy off your back, I'll do this experiment. I'll set him up. And, and he did the first experiments with uh, uh, three or four root canal teeth that were sent by Hal Huggins, and I was, at the very least, mildly interested at all until I saw the results, and it was shocking. And, and I think when you see the data today, you'll find it's, uh, this is something that you have to go back to the original work of Weston Price, and it fits into all the published literature, even the modern literature today that says there are anaerobic bacteria that you know, exist in the dentin tubules of root canal teeth, or dead teeth. And so this is what we're going to talk about, is the toxicity, and we're measuring it in a similar way as the other one. And I don't know what, this is just introducing me, you know who I am. <clears throat> but the process we start out with, uh, it's very simple. People would send us teeth, and I told them, I don't want you washing them. I don't want any of the fluoride water from California on my teeth. Uh, anyway, no, I just make, I mean, you have to keep things consistent. Just wipe the teeth off, put them in a thing, freeze them, and send it to us. And several people sent us teeth. I checked out, and one of the first ones was Blanche Gruby. She sent us a large number of teeth. And Blanche probably holds a record for sending us the worst-looking teeth we've ever seen. <laughs> But the process, you, t you take a tooth that's sent to us, which could be an infected tooth, you wash it in a mill of distilled water, you take it out of there, you save, the, you save that soak, you don't do anything with it because we don't need it, we test it first. This is extremely toxic, but this could be material that came off the outside of the tooth. It would be in the curricular fluid. You wash the tooth again, and you save that solution, and you... You don't use it because it's still too toxic to uh, give you a good separation. So you wash it the third time, and it's this third wash, and they're each a mill water of water, distilled water that's totally non-toxic. It's the same water we use in our buffers, etc. And we use this last water. So if you go through there, there's 3,000 microliters. 3 mLs is 3,000 microliters. And we use microliters, which are a thousandth of an mL, in our toxicity assays, and we use it in the third wash. If you were an analytical chemist or a quantitative analysis person, you would know by the time that you washed it three times that you've really gotten almost everything off on the first two washes or out on the first two washes. So we can let this soak, and I will tell you, if we get a very toxic tooth, we can put it in the freezer, come back, you know, after it's in the freezer for a couple months, take it out, soak it again, and get another toxic solution. So it's very difficult. The toxin's inside. Also, if you take a tooth that is toxic, moderately toxic, and you take a pair of pliers and break it and crack it open, you'll get a lot more toxin out a lot faster. So the toxin's inside the tooth, and all the literature would support that. But this is the solution we're doing. And this is one of the first tests we did of the first type, and this is done using brain protein, just brain homogenous like you've seen before. We run a different type of gel so you can see creatine kinase. So this is tubulin that we see. Uh, this is a control. You're labeling tubulin, creatine kinase, and this band here at the bottom is uh, actin and uh, glutamine synthetase. So we know what the enzymes are. And you can see in our control, it photolabels very nicely. Same thing on this side. And here's a tooth that came from patient number 15. It was tooth number 19. That tooth is not toxic. You get right next to it, tooth number 13. It's not toxic. The tubulin is just fine. The bottom band doesn't seem to be affected a lot. It is affected somewhat. But it's totally toxic to creatine kinase. Creatine kinase is very important. It's, it's CPK assay. You do it if you have a heart attack. This is an enzyme. This is a product, an enzyme that uh, makes creatine and creatine phosphate. It's used to make ATP. It's very much involved in energy translocation in the cell. And so if you look at that one, it's quite unusual. Now we can jump over here. Here's one that's just the opposite. The creatine kinase is inhibited slightly, but the tubulin is totally wiped out. Here are two that look just like you would see in an AD brain. The tubulin is wiped out. And here's one that's an extremely toxic tooth, producing a, a protein that is contributing coming outside that's still quite to, uh, able to photo label, but it knocks out about everything. And this tooth right here, number 14, is one of the, you know, we would say this is about as toxic as you can get. Every enzyme in there was wiped out. Now, I would go across, and this comes uh, where we're going to go is the fact that we now test cubicular fluid with a little toothpick that soaks up. You can put it between the tooth and the gum. 
It soaks up about six to eight microliters of curricular fluid. You send that to us, and we analyze that. And what's important is you know, what you can and cannot do with this test that we're now uh, uh, presenting to people. And if we look at patient number 67, we got five teeth from this patient. And here's the control. And you can see this tooth. And I, we didn't get the numbers on the last two, but these was, they, were, they were pulled to put in a denture, I think. But this tooth is not toxic. See, nothing. I mean, we get nothing out of that tooth that we can extract that's toxic, that's measurably toxic anyway. The tooth right next to it is severely toxic. It has something growing in it that's very unusual because they were all treated exactly the same. The tooth next to it is, is slightly toxic. I mean, it's, it, there's a decrease in both the creatine kinase and tubulin. But then the tooth on the outside here, again, is much less toxic. We would say that's not very significant toxicity. So what this says, in the same mouth, if you can pull the teeth out and separate them as separate identities, wash them, and then soak the toxin out of them, the bacteria living in different teeth, you know, or the toxins produced by different teeth can come out at a different level. And from other work we've done, they can even have a different uh, type of toxicity. I mean, one can be, you can have a tooth that knocks out creatine kinase and another tooth that takes out tubulin. And what this, when you try and measure this in the mouth, you get confusing results because these toxins are volatile. I mean, you've smelled people with death breath. They have hydrogen sulfide, methyl thiol, and other smelling compounds. These things spread throughout the mouth very rapidly. So you get a mixture of the toxicities when you're measuring the curricular fluid. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a fact. So, but anyway, this was our first test. And you can see we can go through and see different types of toxicities in the different types of teeth. And this was using 100 microliters of the third 1 ml soap from a root canal tooth. Now, <clears throat> to, to show that this makes sense, and this is on our web page if you want to find it. And this was done in uh, Italy, and it was published in the Journal of Clinical Paradontology. And it's the occurrence of invading bacteria in the radicular dentin of periodontal disease treats, microbiological findings. And what they did is they took patients that had uh, periodontal disease and patients without periodontal disease, and they extracted their teeth and they did the following. They uh, cleaned them up on the outside in the cementum. They made sure they, they got rid of as much of any infection that would be on the outside or any bacteria on the outside as they could. They cut a window in there. They went in and they cut out a piece of the dentin sample. And then they took this and they dropped it into uh, an incubating broth that would be a positive for the uh, uh, colony formation of bacteria. In other words, if there are bacteria in there, they could start dividing and grow colonies. And when they soaked this with this material, they just put it in there and gently swirled it. They took an aliquot and did a culture study, and they showed that people with periodontal disease had about 500 colonies uh, you know, per sample versus about maybe six or seven from the controls, six or seven or less. And then they took this material in that tube and they crushed it. The theory being that if the bacteria are inside this dentin, you should see a tremendous explosion in bacterial colonies, whereas if it were controlled, it would be about the same. And that's exactly what they found. And if you would like to read this, we have the reference. And this was done at the universe, a university in Italy. And when they crushed this, the colony count went from 500 to over 3,000 colonies where in, in the uh, people that had periodontal disease. And the people who didn't have periodontal disease, there was no significant increase. That tells you that the bacteria in periodontal disease invade through the cementum into the dentin sample and uh, get into the tooth and can cause an infection. And this was not an endodontically treated tooth. It was a live tooth. So this can also happen in teeth that have uh, you know, endodontic treatment or, or just avital by some breakage or some other reason. And this was done in Italy. And I would tell you, when you go through our web page, the thing that's kind of embarrassing as an American, we have over 400 references that you can key down to to back up everything that we say that we see in our research that makes our research fit into the published research with regard to periodontal disease, cavitations, root canal teeth, etc. I would say over 95% of those references come from Europe. Very few come from the United States. And if you had read that, you would not have been surprised about the materials presented in Dr. Loesch's presentation. I mean, it's only in the states where you would be surprised. The uh, thing I want to talk about, anaerobic bacteria, certain bacteria. Bacteria you know, need substrates, and they use things like cysteine. This is an amino acid that's in our bloodstream. It's in our diet when we eat. We have to have this. If this is, in, if this is fed to certain bacteria, this is the enzyme that does it. But to make a long story short, it produces hydrogen sulfide, H2S. This is what gives the death breath smell to people and 
who have bad breath or who have periodontal disease, They'll, you'll smell this, and it's you know, the active ingredient in rotten eggs. If you take cysteine, or pardon me, methionine, methionine makes this compound, it's called methane thiol. Both of these compounds are considered very neurotoxic, and both of these compounds have, are kind of a, an odor. And it's very important that you look at this particular compound. This compound and the production of this compound is important in periodontal disease. And if you remember what we've talked about with mercury, mercury will react very, react, very reactively, pardon me, very rapidly with this sulfur. And in the process of doing it, we know that in a mouth, in these toxic teeth, if someone has periodontal disease or root canals and mercury in uh, fillings, they're going to be making compounds that are much more strange because you cannot have in a reaction vessel such as a round bottom flask that chemists use or a mouth such as each of us have, if we have mercury vapor and the products produced by anaerobic bacteria, we're going to make some very strange organic mercurial compounds. And we have to keep that in, in mind. Now, we extracted a toxin from a root canal teeth and we looked at hydrogen sulfide and we compared them. And here's our little study. And if you remember my first lecture, I said, remember, tublin doesn't float label, tublin abnormally partitions in brain tissue. And so this is a controlled brain, and we break it into soup and pellet fractions, and here's a zero degrees, and here's an increasing concentration of hydrogen sulfide, which is a known neurotoxin, and we go out to 800 micromolar. It's easy to know when you have hydrogen sulfide. It smells to high heaven. I mean, you, you, people down the hallway know you're working with it. This root canal solution doesn't stink, not unless you hold it real close to your nose, and we're all afraid to do that because we don't know what's in there, but it definitely does not give off a smell from any distance. And if we look here at the staining of beta tubulin, if we go from a control, here's the soup right here, that point right there, and compare that to the beta tubulin pellet over here, there's no, dis there's no decrease. In other words, the soup level stays the same as we treat with hydrogen sulfide, a known toxin produced by anaerobic bacteria. But if we go over here from this tooth, Compare that one to this one, and you can see what's happening to the tubulin, and it's abnormally partitioning into the pellet fraction, and this is being caused by increasing amounts of this toxic solution that we got from a root canal. And what we're doing here, this was 2 and a half, 5, 10, and 20 microliters. So at 10 microliters, we saw a major partitioning of the 1,000. That's 10 one thousandths of the third ml wash. So this is a very potent material if it does anything. Now, we did an autoradiograph because we photolabeled the tubulin before we did the separation. And what we see is that the hydrogen sulfide didn't have any effect on the tubulin photolabeling. So it's not the toxin that's bothering tubulin in AD brain or in this particular, and it's maybe not the mechanism by which hydrogen sulfide is toxic. But let's look at this root canal solution. Here's the soup and the pellet. If we look at this, look at the drop. This is at 2.5, 5, and by the time we get to 10, we've totally inhibited the photolabeling and the same thing at 20. So what we have is a toxin produced by a bacteria that lives inside a root canal tooth that will cause tubulin to block its photolabeling and to abnormally partition into the uh, pellet fraction. And this is exactly what we see in Alzheimer's disease. And it does it without affecting these proteins. I mean, right here, that looks like an AD brain to me. This doesn't mean that this is a cause of Alzheimer's disease, but it is a working hypothesis in our laboratory that toxins produced by certain bacteria in the body can you know, make compounds that we should investigate to see whether or not they're involved in neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's and ALS. So we come down and we look at a CSF sample, a cerebral spinal fluid sample from a controlled patient. I believe this came from a lady who was having a baby, and we just got a mill of her CSF, and we take about 50 microliters for each one of these samples. And you can see that CSF is very clean. You don't see any proteins down in this region on staining. It's maybe a light protein band through here that's very low. And this is what the gel looks like. And again, we treated this with hydrogen sulfide and root canal solution. And this was after, and then we photolabeled it. And when we looked at this, one microliter converted the photolabeling of this 21 kilodalton protein, which is the range of the protein that's missing in ALS, took it from here down to here and then totally abolished it and had very little effect on this protein, very little effect on this protein. Hydrogen sulfide at the same time, you know, had no effect on these proteins that we could measure, but it also took out this protein, but it took 300 micromolar to get it done 
but it did have a, a significant effect at 20 and 300 micromolars. So some of these toxins do behave in the same way as a hydrogen sulfide to certain proteins. And that does indicate that, you know, uh, it's not ridiculous to think about root canals or oral toxins or toxins produced by anaerobic bacteria to maybe be causal in certain of the diseases that we can't find a cause for. You see, if you're a scientist, you sit there and you shake your head in amazement. We found the cause of AIDS. We found the cause of polio, numerous other diseases. And yet we've spent a lot more money on ALS, MS, and Alzheimer's disease, and we have no clue today what causes them. And maybe it's not something that exists right in the brain tissue or in the neurological tissue. Maybe it's a toxicity that they get exposed to, such as mercury or mercury-type compounds that might be generated in the oral cavity. So now we want to go back and talk about how selective are these toxins. Do you remember, Dr. Lohr said that there were about 300 microorganisms that are involved? And that's the reason we don't have good tests for periodontal disease. It's hard to get an antibody that recognizes 300 different microbes or bacteria. So we've dropped below that, and we're looking at the toxins that are produced by these different bacteria. All we're looking, worried about is what toxicity comes out of this solution, and probably is it, is it produced by the different anaerobes, or and it could even be aerobe, but mostly where these are located, they're anaerobes. And here's one we're talking about, can we selectively take out creatine kinase? And here we're talking about tooth A versus tooth B. Both of these teeth are toxic. At 100 microliters, both of these wiped out creatine kinase, and uh, I think, yeah, that's all they did. And if you look at the level of concentration, when we added one microliter, we saw a drop from here, this level, to this obvious level, and by the time we got to five or 15 microliters, we had totally knocked out creatine kinase, having very little effect on tubulin or uh, the combination of actin and glutamine synthetase. This tooth over here, we had to get all the way out to 50 microliters before we start seeing a significant drop. So the toxicity level in each tooth is different, and it may be just the virulence of the bacteria, how much uh, uh, toxin it makes, or the type of toxin it makes. And so we compare them, and one can look at this and say, well, it's not an artifact that we're seeing toxicity. We're not looking at one enzyme. The nice thing about the photolabeling technique is we can look at 10 enzymes in one test tube at the same time and, and differentiate between the type of toxicity. However, what we found right away that the amount of toxin that you had to add to different brains would differ, and you can't, uh, people someplace else may not get, have access to normal brain tissue to do a study on. So we decided we would buy enzymes so other people could repeat our studies. I like people trying to repeat what I do. I mean, it's, if they can't do it, they come visit my lab and, and I'll teach them how to do it. And so I'd make that offer to anybody. If anybody wants and the ADA doubts that this works, bring your best scientists. We'll train them and show them how to do it and they can do it on their own. And, but what we decided to do is we were going to take and test a bank of six or seven enzymes. And this is what we're continuously doing now to see can we pick up toxins that might affect them. And we want them to be able to separate on the gel. So we picked out proteins with different molecular weights with step ladder down. And these proteins are phosphoglucomutase, pyruvate kinase, phosphoglycerate kinase, creatine kinase, adenylate kinase, and acidic fibroblast growth factor. This is the protein we think is affected in ALS. It's the 21,000 kilodalton protein. And I would tell you, we published the active site or the ATP binding site of this protein, and it has a cysteine buried down in the active site, which makes sense. We photolabeled these proteins with no additions and with the addition of uh, root canal toxin or hydrogen sulfide, and this is two millimolars, so this is really high concentration. We wanted to make sure it worked. And you know, you can look at all this data, but it would be like, here, here's the control, here's the root canal toxin, and this is with two millimolar hydrogen sulfide. Same thing here, and to make a long story short, all of these things are susceptible, since they're sulfur-containing or cysteine-containing proteins and susceptible to mercury and other cysteine-derived reagents, and they are toxic to the root canals as well as the toxins, as well as the normal toxin that everyone knows that is produced in uh, periodontal disease. As a matter of fact, the Swedes have shown that the concentration of hydrogen sulfide in deep periodontal pockets approaches two millimolar, and that's the reason we use that concentration. So here's what our test looks like when we were trying to you know, sort it out, and that's that we have different enzymes, pyruvate kinase, phosphoglycerate kinase, creatine kinase, adenylate kinase, and acidic fibroblast growth factor. Now I want to point out that phosphoglycerate kinase has recently been shown by researchers in Canada to be at low activity in the blood of people with chronic fatigue. Phosphoglycerate kinase makes a compound called bisphosphoglycerate, which is absolutely necessary for, to be present for the release of oxygen from hemoglobin. 
You realize when you bind oxygen, when you breathe it, you have to bind it. The conditions have to be slightly different. When it gets to the tissue where you need to release the oxygen, like where your hand's doing some work, the bisphosphoglycerate has to be there so you can release the oxygen. Otherwise, you can run around with a lot of oxygenated blood and you can't release it, so you're under anaerobic conditions. Just remember that, that's phosphoglycerate kinase. And there's no reason or no known cause of it being inhibited, except one might say if you're breathing hydrogen sulfide, it would be inhibited, or if you're swallowing or getting into your body a toxin from a root canal tooth. Here's our, here's our controls, there and there, and you can see it as we go across with these root canal teeth that they're quite toxic. And the toxin here does not match the toxin from, the root, uh, from hydrogen sulfide. I mean, they're a different material. And to see this kind of toxicity in this bank of assays, we have to go around 15 to 25 micromolar hydrogen sulfide. So we have a test, and, and we can develop the amount that we need to add to see whether or not there's a toxicity existing. We do find some strange things. In our purified enzyme assay, we have hydrogen sulfide increasing here. Here's the effect of hydrogen sulfide. It goes out to about 50 to 100 micromolar, and then it wipes out everything. We go over and test this toxic tooth. We have something that when we add two microliters, or two one-thousandths of an ml of that solution, we totally abolish the photolabeling of phosphoglycerate kinase and creatine kinase. They're abolished as surely by two micromolar anyway. And yet, we have no effect on this enzyme, which seems to be uh, almost enhanced photolabeling in the presence of hydrogen sulfide. So this is a very specific difference, indicating that the toxins we're looking at aren't those that are normally considered to be produced by anaerobic bacteria. Again, this is a screen of teeth that we've taken out and washed. 104 is a patient number, and tubes 22, 25, and 34 are from the same patient. Our controls are over here. You can see all of these enzymes photolabeled very nicely. If we go over here and we compare 22, we look at it. If we look at those three enzymes and the one of uh, the phosphorylase, say, this is not a toxic tooth. 25, which is next to it, isn't very toxic. Seems to be a little bit of toxicity in the pyruvate kinase, but when we get to tooth number 34, it's extremely toxic. And if we look at the other patients, again, we can find the system. Here's one that takes out phosphoglycerate kinase and drops this one, but doesn't have any effect on creatine kinase at all. The, uh, long, make a long story about here, here's another tooth that knocks out pyruvate kinase and doesn't touch, touch creatine kinase or phosphoglycerate kinase. So what we can conclude from this is that these teeth contain different types of toxins that can affect different enzymes and perhaps lead to a different uh, type of disease or a different uh, effect on the human. Yes? I, no, I don't. Uh, the thing I would tell you on all of the samples I've got, but I have gotten these from, we've got these now probably from 300 different dentists. And w the, the thing that needs to be done, and it's called research, and I can't do that research. I, I, wouldn't I couldn't look at a tooth. I get confused about what number a tooth is. Uh, but I think, you know, the, and if I did see a sick tooth, I probably wouldn't know it unless it was really bad. I do think that we need to do research where somebody in a clinical setting takes the health history of the person, when did you get the root canal, how long did you have it, was it well done, poorly done, uh, you know, those things all come into consideration. So, and I, 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 don't, I don't step out of the bounds of my expertise, so I don't know where these teeth came from or how old the patients were. That's something that dentists and physicians and clinicians have to address. Yes? I don't know that either. Most of these were gutta percha teeth, though, from what I was told, from what I understand. But I don't know, I didn't know that you had silver points were used without gutta percha. I thought they were used together. But I, that's what I know. I mean, you know, don't, don't trust me about any of the dental work. I, I, all I can do is measure what you send me. But I can tell you that what we can tell you is that this test is real reliable, especially for teeth. I mean, definitely we can tell you what the toxicity is for that particular tooth. Because you can't argue with this data where we take two teeth or three teeth from the same mouth and two of them aren't toxic and one of them is extremely toxic. And you see different toxicities from different things. And this is a very common occurrence when we have people that send us three or four teeth. Uh, this is the one we're talking about cavitational material. And I would say that, you know, in the early talk when they said people who are edentulous and they don't have periodontal disease and yet you're seeing a, a, a risk uh, heart risk uh, problem, heart attack problem, stroke problem, etc. You know, 
uh, these don't exist according to uh, certain people in organized dentistry, but since I've had four removed from my mouth and sat and watched them remove four from my wife's mouth and watched them dig them out and seen the uvular nerve hanging like a tight rope between two fixed points uh, and seen them dip it out and I've tested it, what I can tell you, this is increasing volumes of cavitational solutions. It's very difficult to measure the exact toxicity because I don't know how big the cavitation is. I don't know how big a sample I got, except they're all very small. But what I can tell you, they're all toxic. Every cavitational material that we've had sent to us has been toxic. And I think the reason for that is it's, uh, if they weren't toxic, they'd heal. And if we look at the addition, they just seem to wipe out all the enzymes at everything, and not, not too much unlike hydrogen sulfide. So uh, this is, this, we have to dilute this up in water, so this is probably quite a diluted toxicity that we're looking at since it's not a tooth and we can't control volume factors. But there's no doubt about the toxicity of these materials. And uh, Bob Jones has de developed an instrument to look at the cavitations, and as soon as he gets that, get that done, I've got some experiments for him to do because then we can measure the density and the volumes or estimate them fairly accurately. And then we can take out 10 microliters of that and we can tell are these all identically toxic? Are some more toxic than others, et cetera? But that work uh, will wait for Bob's instrument to be completed, which will pick out these cavitations. And the only thing I would say, it, it's, it's an amazement to me that anybody would say cavitations don't exist. When you can go in and, and have them done on yourself or see them done on a colleague, and I know a lot of people that would volunteer to let anybody that thinks they don't exist watch them have theirs removed. Uh, so now let's go down to the last part of this. The, the thing that came out, people ask uh, Kurt and I when we, we give our talks, we want to know if a tooth is toxic in situ before we do extract it. And can you do that? And, and we thought about it. And as toxic, if I can see toxicity with a few microliters of something in a third 3,000 microliter wash, if I could suck out f 5 or 10 or 20 microliters of cubicular fluid, I ought to be able to determine the toxicity. And so we started doing this, and this took us a long time to work it out. It hasn't been easy, I mean, because there are a lot of factors. And the thing is, this is also susceptible that I have to depend on the dentist to take the same type of sample. But we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot in the last few months, and I think we have a very good test now. And this is an example of the test. These are our uh, our sample enzymes, and you can see anything, like if you see this protein and it's not over here, you gave us that. That came off in your curricular sample. That's a protein produced in the curricular fluid. Uh, if you see one like this, it's not over here. That's another one. There's one you can't see it here, but it photolabels. It's not, you'll see that it's not, uh, this one photolabels, but you'll see two bands here. And you see one down here? We didn't get that one either. But there's several things that we have to look at here. This really enhanced our test, because this is the protein staining profile. This protein is produced and is, you know, in response to inflammation. It's an inflammatory protein. Like if you get poison ivy on your hand, your body rushes fluid and, and proteins there, it builds up, it soaks up the toxin, keeps the toxin from getting in your body. Wherever you see this protein, and you can see all the proteins that we had in our test are all there, you see this protein, you kind of expect to see enhanced toxicity. Except on some of them, you'll see this one in both of them. Some of them, you'll just see this one. This one's alkaline phosphatase. There's no doubt alkaline phosphatase is associated with certain types of periodontal disease, but not all. It certainly isn't associated with this one. This is a protease activity. We find some of the teeth or some of the curricular fluids you send us have proteases in them. And proteases uh, do things like see creatine kinase here, how heavy it is, how heavy it is, and how it's gone down uh, quite a bit, see how much less this is. What was ever in this sample that was sent to us is chewing up the proteins. And there are anaerobic bacteria associated with periodontal disease that produces proteases. Now, what do proteases do? Anybody know how blood cascade system works? It's a protease-activated cascade. First protease now activates the first factor, which is a protease that activates the second factor. And I teach this in, bio, in, in graduate level biochemistry. Clotting is induced by the presence of protease in the bloodstream that are activated by several factors. Now, we photolabeled all these samples after mixing them, but first what we do is we look for these proteins. And I want to tell you before we get to it now, if you get reports from us, and Kurt was going to talk about this, and he made slides that were really nice, that tell you that when we want to find the site where the, where the major infection is, and we look at the toxicity, we, can, we have a hard time doing it, but the toxins are so volatile that if the, tox say if the toxic tooth is right here, the toxin will collect as much in the back as it will anywhere else because they're volatile. 
they're water soluble, we're swallowing all the time. So what we can do is measure for sure the toxicity in the curricular fluid, but we don't know what the site is. But looking at these proteins, if we get one mouth with several points, when we see these proteins elevated at a site, they're not so mobile. They identify the site of infectivity. That's what we're finding. So we look at the autoradiogram of this, and what you can see, these proteins, but let's look at this lane right here. This is a root canal. And we have a lot of this protein, which is an alpha and phosphatase. And look how it knocks out the photolabeling. It photolabels very nicely because it's a bacterial alpha and phosphatase. It's very happy there. It likes, I mean, it doesn't mind it being anaerobic or full of these toxins. So we see an increased photolabeling in this protein. And you can see it's in here in several of these, and a decrease in all the others. And everywhere you see this, you see increased toxicity. Now, you would think, well, then alpha and phosphatase would be a good marker. You know, we've got to be very careful about this, because if you go over here and look at this one, where we had the protease, it wiped out the photolabeling of all these proteins, even though they were there. And we find some others, like this one doesn't have very much of that, and it's toxic. So the toxicity goes along, but there are several different proteins that might be affected, and we find very strange things, especially from samples sent to us by Blanche Groovy. Something about people living in northern Pennsylvania or something, that, you know, they grow strange bugs. But uh, here, you can see, here's a protein of photolabels that we couldn't even see on the gel. And that corresponds, again, to a bacterial alpha and phosphatase that we've noticed. So the, the, the test that we have now depends on you know, three or more different things. One, the toxicity. We wipe out the photolabeling of these samples. And uh, then we have proteins that jump in here that fall in and out. Like, you see this proteins here? It, we didn't add that. Here's a pro it's not present over here. And we're beginning now to put this data together. As we collect more information from the dentist and the doctors that send us this, we're, we're, we're studying this and we're making, compiling this all on computers so we can go back and look at the effect and see if this will correlate to any disease. But to do that, first we've got to say, before I talk to you and make you spend a lot of time doing clinical studies, that I can really repeat and, and see something that's uh, reliable and how many different parameters am I going to have to look at. And so we, we look at the, the innovation of the photolabeling of the different enzymes that are in the system. We see other enzymes that are, that are dumped in here in addition to uh, the ones that uh, we have. So we look at the effect on the innovation, then we look at the presence of certain proteins that photolabel that are produced by the bacteria, and then we look at certain proteins that are produced in response to certain types of inflammation. And so we have those three types that we consider. And now, uh, everyone's asking us to identify these toxins because they're obviously not mercury. They don't behave like mercury, and they don't behave like hydrogen sulfide. And we haven't, uh, right now, we have clues. I mean, we have real strong opinions of what we think they are. And we're now collecting this and, and working about procedures to, uh, to isolate it. And I'll tell you one thing. On these toxic teeth, if we take an extract from the most toxic tooth we have, and if we dump into that solution, we try three types of resin. A resin that will bind heavy metals or cations, a resin that will bind organic acids, is positively charged, so it binds the organic acids, and then a resin that binds hydrophobic compounds. And, when we, and this is charcoal. If you place charcoal in one of these uh, tubes and you spin the charcoal down and test the supernatant, the toxicity is totally removed. The anion binding and the cation binding resins have very little effect on the toxicity. They may reduce it 10 or 15 percent in certain cases. So most of these toxins are very hydrophobic compounds. At the same time, they're soluble in water at small amounts, and they're extremely toxic. So we, we want to look at this, and this gives us an example of where our thinking uh, uh, and how it goes. And this is if we have a, an avital tooth that's producing hydrogen sulfide and methyl thio from methionine and cysteine. And this is sitting in the mouth with someone that has an amalgam filling. And this is the reason I asked Dr. Loesch the question this morning. This releases mercury vapor. Mercury reacts instantaneously with hydrogen sulfide and methyl thio. It doesn't take any time at all. You can't have these in the same vicinity without them reacting. And I think that the reaction of mercury with hydrogen sulfide producing mercury sulfide, which has another name, it's called cinnabar. It's how mercury is stored in the earth as a mineral. This is what causes an amalgam tattoo. And what got me started on this is that my daughter had a root canal tooth from a bicycle accident when she was 12 years old. She was 24 years old. She had chronic fatigue syndrome and trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, this was not decided by me, but by uh, a, a physician in Pennsylvania. She also looked like an anorexic, and I, I'm dead serious. I, and I told her this when I, because she didn't want to have her tooth pulled. She didn't want it removed. She's rather pretty in this front tooth. Uh, 
She also had a big amalgam tattoo on the front of her gum. When she smiled, you could see a purple gum that kept getting bigger and bigger. And I was worried about her, uh, and I started thinking about it, and I thought, how would you get a chip of mercury or amalgam in the front of a gum when you only, she only had three fillings in her back jaw teeth? And then as I read the literature and thing, it all of a sudden dawned on me that amalgam tattoos aren't caused by, you know, a drill flipping out a chunk of uh, amalgam filling, as I had told. It's caused by the reaction of mercury sulfide with mercury, I mean, pardon me, hydrogen sulfide with mercury, precipitating uh, mercury sulfide and equivalent type compounds. This could also be silver sulfide in the tissue near the infected tooth. And she had the root canal tooth pulled, and uh, this was done by Dr. Jack Cole, who usually is here. I think he had to leave for another emergency. Uh, the root was totally black inside. The socket inside was black. The tooth smelled. I mean, it would bring tears to your eyes. And when you cut it in half and you move the gutta percha up and down, you could blow air bubbles out the side. So the tooth had deteriorated, and it looked beautifully when she smiled. And unless she smiled high enough, you could see the amalgam tattoo. But what this does confirm is that this process occurs. And if you get a reaction with hydrogen sulfite, you have to get a reaction with methylthiol because this tooth has equally available to it cysteine and methionine, which are amino acids that float around in your bloodstream if you eat a steak. This would react with mercury to form these two compounds. The first one would be methylthiol mercury chloride, and the next one would be methylthiol mercury, methylthiol mercury, or the bis compound, bis methylthiol mercury, these two compounds. Now, all of you know what methyl mercury looks like if you've read any of the literature. And you remember the lady that I talked about earlier from Dartmouth who died by getting dimethyl mercury spilled on her glove at two drops. At least according to her, it was two drops. This compound looks very similar to dimethyl mercury, except it has two sulfurs here. But still, it's very hydrophobic because of the methyl groups which are, are hydrophobic. So what we've done is we've taken a toxic mercury compound and we've converted into a, an organic mercurial. And I, I have read in several papers in the uh, JADA journal that the body can't make organic mercurials. Human body can't. It can with a little help from a bacteria. We tested the toxicity of these against the bank of our enzymes. <clears throat> and when we do this, you can see this is mercury alone, this is methylthiol alone, and this is monomethylthiol mercury. And if you go across here, this is 12, 25, 50, you can see it goes across and knocks it out. This is micromolar range. Same thing over here. If we use the dimethyl, it's not quite as toxic as reactivity, reactive in our system. And that's because it has to lose one of these methyls to become reactive. But this one would partition. And if I had a choice of drinking this one, which doesn't look as toxic as this one, but I know this one would be more soluble in my lipid bilayers, I would drink this one. And I would drink this one before I would drink either one of these, if somebody held a gun on me. I mean, the thing is, these are very toxic to the enzymes we test, and so we have to consider this type of compound when we look at the toxicities that we're extracting from these teeth that are from people who have amalgam fillings. If we tested these in their ability to kill cells, this is 100% cell killing. The line we see here is mercury toxicity, which goes up, and it does kill the cells, but we have to get out there about eight micromolar before it kills all the cells. The other two lines that run right on top of each other is the methyl and dimethyl mercury chloride, and you can see they go there. And when they hit this point, when we're about 0.5 uh, micromolar to before you get to one micromolar, they, they, they give 100% killing. So they're much more toxic. And this wasn't even done with the right type of cells. There are other cells that would be more relevant for us to do this study, but we did it on with what we had. And we're now getting a graduate student starting on screening all of these compounds. Plus, there's, you know, we make uh, dimethyl sulfide. Bacteria make that also. That's CH3SCH3. That also reacts with mercury, and we're making that and testing for its toxicity also. But what it does say, if you're doing a risk assessment analysis, such as Mark Richardson did, and he did a very good job, but he used data where people just put in mercury and mercury alone. And we don't live in that kind of world. Again, you know, relevant earlier to the comments on zinc and cadmium, which we're all exposed to, we're also exposed to hydrogen sulfide and, and methylthiol, and this exacerbates the existing toxicity that we would see with mercury. So the conclusions in this is that we found chemicals and cavitational materials in some teeth containing root canals that are toxic to you know, a large number of enzymes. We picked enzymes that were critical all in glycolytic metabolism, or all in neurological tissue, brain tissue, tubulin, acreatin kinase, and the glycolytic enzymes. 
I would point out that the phosphoglycerate kinase, which is inhibited by our uh, toxins from teeth, that's found to be low in chronic fatigue, that there was a test, someone in Australia has a diagnostic test for chronic fatigue syndrome, and he puts the patients on a treadmill and he works them real hard, and if they produce lactic acid, like you would if you were, one of us went on a marathon, not in condition, then they have chronic fatigue. That means that they, they can't carry oxygen where it's supposed to be carried, yet they have fully oxygenated blood, just like the controls. The problem is that enzyme's inhibited, they're not making bisphosphoglycerate, which is a compound that releases oxygen from hemoglobin. And if you don't release the oxygen, you operate under anaerobic conditions. If you operate under anaerobic conditions, for those of you that understand metabolism, the pyruvate, instead of going into the TCA cycle, making energy, giving you ATP so you, you, you feel good, you have strength, instead of going there, it goes into anaerobic metabolism and it's converted to lactate. And so instead of feeling good with your diet, you end up producing lactic acid, you have fibromyalgia or muscle soreness, and no energy. And so uh, we really have to look and find out what inhibits phosphoglycerate kinase in these chronic fatigue patients. I'd love to test their curricular fluid and see what kind of toxicity they have. And I think this would be something we need to look at. These toxicants, by the way, are chemical in nature. They are not proteins. We can saturate, we can filter those out. We have things we call a, a centricon filters that will keep proteins in the upper layer and allow the solution to go through. These compounds are low molecular weight chemical compounds. They are not protein toxins. They are not toxic in the form that say cholera toxin, pertussis toxin, and certain other uh, protein toxins or endotoxins uh, are considered. This is a totally different category. You are looking at the waste products of anaerobic bacteria that are causing this toxicity. All cavitational materials tested were toxic. There's nothing better you can do for yourself. If you're a lady and you're thinking you're needing a, a facelift or a wrinkle removement, go get your cavitations removed. Uh, uh, my wife has lost 60% of her wrinkles by having her cavitations removed. It's just phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I mean, and you know, you can look at a lot of people, go up and ask them. I mean, it's, it's worth doing it. Even if you're not sick, it'll make you feel better. Uh, the toxicity varied dramatically with teeth containing root canals. I mean, some were extremely toxic, some displayed little if any toxicity. So the test is good. Not all root canal teeth are toxic. They may get toxic, and they may be toxic in a way that I'm not measuring, but in our test, about 25% of them are not toxic. And so I don't know what the difference is. Maybe it's the type of bacteria that invade them and set up housekeeping first. Maybe the type of filling material. But you can't just carte blanche say, you know, root canals, should be totally abolished because some of them are toxic. However, you can look an endodontist straight in the eye. If you have a disease and you can't find a reason, and especially if it's a neurological-based disease, and there is no clinical diagnosis of what caused it, like when you go in and they say, you feel like crap, and they say, oh, there's nothing wrong with you, go see your dentist, or, or go have, have your, 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 you know, the, the test done. Uh, and the data support the concept that there's more, more than one toxin. It doesn't support it. It proves that there, there are multiple toxins being made by these different bacteria. Uh, these toxins are much more uh, potent at inhibition than hydrogen sulfide and several other compounds. Uh, and it's hard to, uh, to describe how much more toxic they are, but uh, some of them are dramatically. I mean, they're so toxic that it's spooky. Uh, but the last thing is that this full labeling technology you know, allows the, the testing of a single toxin a, a sample against a bank of several purified enzymes. It's going to allow us to categorize the type of toxicities and uh, get us into this uh, uh, situation where we can make some sense of what happens in the body. And I would all, all encourage you, we wrote a website or web page. It's educational. We're not trying to sell you anything. Over 400 references are refereed in there when we say that, you know, bacteria getting root canal teeth. On there will be the reference. It'll have the number. You click on the number. It'll take you to the original reference. And we did this because I got tired of Xeroxing all my papers to try and protect dentists who were being uh, taken after by the uh, local state boards. And uh, uh, if you want to print it, you can even order it through Lonesome Doc. We don't make a penny off of it. And we'd like to help you. So go in there and take time and educate because you don't learn this stuff, you know, in a half-hour lecture with me talking. It's a www.altcorp.com. It's very educational, and every month we're going to put new articles in there. And the other thing I would tell you that is abysmal to me, most of the references you see that are making progress 
and support the data that you heard from the first speaker this morning was done in European countries, not in the United States. Canada's pretty good. I congratulate the Canadians. At least you support some research. It's not being done. It hasn't been done in the last large number of years in the United States, and that's really kind of embarrassing. Yes? Yes, we're, we're doing, we have that test. We're not done with it, and Kurt has a lot more than I had. He could have given you the exact numbers. What we generally see is that when we get extracted teeth that have been filled with biocalyx, they, on the average, are much less toxic. They're not without toxicity, but much less toxic than the average tooth we get with gutta percha. That may be because we get some gutta percha teeth that are a lot older. Uh, but, you know, as a chemist, I can tell you, Bacteria will not grow in calcium oxide or calcium hydroxide, so you're probably decreasing the amount of bacteria in the tooth. Whether you can totally prevent it or not, I don't know. We have also done testing where we've tested cubicular fluid on certain samples uh, of root canal teeth that were filled with gutta percha. We, uh, uh, then the dentist did a, a new root canal with biocalyx, and the toxicity dropped significantly, over 50%. But the take-home message here, you know, keep the, your periodontal disease back here. I mean, I routinely, religiously, rinse my mouth out with a herbal antibiotic uh, rinse. And I had myself tested some time ago, about three years ago, and I had a bacteremia. You know, they look in your blood and they look for bacteria. They found them without uh, any problem. I've been using uh, a dental herb uh, uh, mouthwash. I had it tested when I was in Australia, and I was sure they were going to find something, because they always do. They couldn't find one bacteria in my blood. My wife's doing the same thing. Uh, this was done by Jenny Burke. Anybody who knows her can call her. She, they searched her. They found one, and they had to look a long time to find it. And she's not as religious about this as I am. But, so I, I think the main thing, if, if there's something we can do here, we need to work on developing something that a person can do in their bathroom every morning that decreases periodontal disease and the infection of these teeth and keeps the, the toxicity down to a level. Because if I had a blackboard here, I want to tell you, the bacteria that are quiescent inside your root canal teeth aren't producing nearly as much toxin as the bacteria gets out and goes into the different uh, curricular regions where there are no bacteria. As they start dividing and growing more rapidly, they produce more toxin. Okay. Uh, You know, I, I can't make the decision that should be made by a good dentist. What we can tell you is that she asked me if this paper point tooth was such that, you know, we would recommend that a tooth be pulled if it came back very toxic and negative. I wouldn't do it based on the toxicity. If the person cleaned up their mouth and the toxicity came back, you want to look for it. And we need to, we need to have a, a longer talk where I can get down. To identify the site where the bacteria are located, you have to look for the proteins, not the toxicity. That toxicity is so volatile and so mobile, it's all over your mouth. No matter if I test several different sites on a mouth, I can't tell you. It's a mixture of all the toxicities of the teeth. And I've done this on Bob Jones and a lot of other people. But you will see toxicity. But you'll only see the protein on one, maybe on one tooth. And that are the proteins that are uh, uh, induced in, in uh, response to you know, the bacteria being there and the inflammation uh, being more rigorous at that site. So if you want to pick out the tooth, and see, you have to do that. I'm not, a, I'm not going to sit out there and, and tell people what teeth to pull. I'm not an MD nor a dentist. But I can give you the data, and you have to look at that. And I think a dentist would be much better at making that decision. I mean, if you guys all want me to recommend your teeth to be pulled, I'll be glad to do it. But I think you'll all want to hunt me down and kill me <laughs> for a while. But I mean, it's, it's, it's an aid to the dentist. This is not a, 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 a total thing. Now, if you want to get something and drill in the tooth and send the stuff inside, we can tell you where the bacteria is in there. But what I think think, underlying think, will happen is that we're going to find out that when we see someone with some level of toxicity due to periodontal disease and anaerobic bacteria, when we see the proteins in the curricular fluid that come from bacteria, that tooth is going to be infected because you remember the first part of this talk, we talked about the bacteria from periodontal disease going into living teeth. It's going to be in there, but that doesn't mean you can't cure it if that tooth is still alive. With antibiotics, you know, put them on a good regimen of, you know, uh, keeping their, their mouth free of bacteria. With a good mouthwash or uh, antiseptic mouthwash that's not full of alcohol. I don't remember, I don't recommend those that have alcohol. I mean, I don't recommend Listerine. Get something that's a little better than that, and they're there. Some of them are sold here. You can look at them. Uh. Yes, I see who you are. <laughs> Thank you.
No, that's 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 a very good question. The the, the thing is, we we've tried to identify them, and what we have to do the concentration from any one toxic extract, which will kill everything, is so low that it's not easy enough to see on mass spec. We have done the biochemical uh, test. We know that we can concentrate them with a hydrophobic resin. We're concentrating them now. I have a, a, a mass spec on order, and we're going to determine that because that's the only way you'll determine it. And they're hydrophobic and they're low molecular weight. And Yes. Yeah, we, we've got the, that. We've looked at all those. We've talked about it. But I doubt that those things at the low concentration would specifically inhibit nucleotide binding proteins at the level we're seeing. You can put in other organic acids. That's not an experiment we haven't done. In our laboratory, we don't work in grams. We work in moles. We work in concentrations. And we would talk about concentrations in the low micromolar. And, 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 and I know some of these organic acids get up in the millimolar range. Kurt, if he'd given his talk, we, we, have, we, have, we have made a list of all the compounds that have been identified in curricular fluid. They're polyamines. They're all of these organic acids you're talking about. They're sulfur compounds. And then we have these mixed with heavy metals or metals that might come to. So right now, I'm not trying. You know, if you're going to do an experiment to identify, and it's important to identify these, you better first convince some granting agency that you're seeing toxicity. Well, I, I think I would agree with that, except when you see when we take teeth, that are root canal teeth, they're usually much more toxic. We have other teeth that don't have that. And where the source is, and if we break the teeth open, they're much more toxic. More toxin comes out. So the argument was just to show that teeth can harbor bacteria and there can be toxicin, toxins located inside these teeth. And it's not in every tooth, and it's not in every root canal tooth. So the toxicity, uh, I wouldn't disagree about the fact it would be on plaques, but we can get this on samples. We're not getting plaque samples, and not only that, if you do the curricular fluid, I'm, I don't take any dental procedure, it takes one minute to put the pick in there, and it does allow the dentist to tell this person, you have something in your mouth that's causing severe toxicity against enzymes. You can't do it by identifying the bacteria, like you say, it takes a long time, they're 300 and you have to culture, this is cheap, and it's very direct. I, I, I agree with that. I believe if we test, tested plaque, since plaque contain a lot of bacteria, I'd be shocked if plaque weren't toxic. But some of the people who have toxic teeth don't have plaque. Some people that are very rigorous and go to, uh, some, I mean, other people can answer this. Have you sent teeth or curricular fluid in from teeth that have been scaled and recently cleaned and, and say a week or so later and found that the toxin is right back there in the, in a, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that. Yes, we do use the patient. We, we do do a controlled pick inside the patient's mouth also at a place that doesn't look like it's infected. And you don't see the bacterial proteins usually in these sites. You only see the bacterial protein around teeth that we would call a vital teeth. I'm glad to talk with you more about that. I don't think what you're saying I disagree with, but obviously somebody disagreed with us that root canal teeth become toxic, and that's the reason I had to do these experiments. The protein test and the, and the toxicity are all done in the same time. All we can... What, what I can tell you, that's what you would expect. We expected when I was naive that you would see a higher level of toxicity next to the teeth. The periodontist and other people in reading the literature said that's not right. You see a mixture of the toxicity of all of them because they move so fast. So if you want to isolate the site where there is an infection, you have to look for the proteins, not the toxin. The toxin just tells you that what you have growing in your mouth is producing a toxic material. And I would also point out, 
if you see what these enzymes, these uh, toxins are hitting, it shouldn't surprise you that they affect stroke, cardiovascular disease, etc. And I don't have all the answers to everything, and we've, we've been working very hard on this. But uh, one thing that we thought, we thought we'd be able to identify a single tooth and the toxin would stay right next to that tooth, doesn't happen. So how do I, how do I recommend the patient to get all four toxins? Well, look, you, the thing we're finding now is that the site where the bacterial infection is will have the bacterial proteins. That won't be at the sites where the toxin It's not nearly as mobile. Okay. I, I'd better quit, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll be at the tonight, so we'll be having plenty of time to ask more questions. Uh, I appreciate all of you being uh, with me on how we've had to shift the schedule around due to some emergencies this weekend. Uh, but I've been able to coax uh, Sam Queen to come back up and offer some, some thoughts and uh, concluding remarks uh, for the weekend. So uh, again, let's welcome up Dr. Sam Queen. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll only take a few minutes because there's some more fun to be had. But I personally want to thank every one of you for coming to this conference. This is one of a kind, really. And I know that your lives are busy and you're trying to make a living out there, and there's a little sacrifice in that. When you come in and make that sacrifice, that kind of tells you some, that tells me something about you. And I know some of you have had a little problem with the dental boards, maybe medical boards. Ost being ostracized is not new to this group. And I know that's another sacrifice. A lot of people don't realize what kind of sacrifice that really is. And I know that practicing mercury-free also means something. What does that mean? That means you actually sacrifice some of your health. You cannot practice mercury-free and remove amalgam filling as with the best technique you can get without some risk to your life, to your health, every day. There's other things in our dental office. I mean, what, what you do in this room, basically, you're... I, I know who you are. That's kind, of, that's kind of exciting. I may not have met every one of you, but I know who you are. And let me say this. A lot of people on the street will ask, Sam, do you know a good doctor? Well, what's that tell you? That tells you that there might be some that aren't so good. Well, what is a good doctor? Well, I tell you what, if I'm looking for a doctor, I want to find a doctor that believes in something. I want to find a doctor that puts his work where his mouth is, that can live it, that can walk through day in and day out. What do you smile about, Dr. Lee? You're right. That can walk in day in and day out and keep doing this. Hats off to you. Now, some of you, I have heard, don't make the living that you'd like to make. Well, you know what? That's about to change. If you're not making it, that's about to change. And I tell you what, the academy is setting up for a giant fall. Not the academy's fall, somebody else's fall. And that is those people who keep placing amalgam fillings. It'll come a time, enough people, the ground roots, when this country will no longer accept an amalgam filling, for instance. And who's going to set the standards for that? This academy is setting that now. So I applaud you for starting this accreditation thing. Now, when it comes to making a living out of all of that, how are you going to do it? Well, as a consumer, you know what I want to know? Can you show me a good doctor? Who's a good doctor? Well, that question tells us what to do, doesn't it? It's, an, it's great that you have an, a dental degree or an MD. I'm envious, really. I tell you what, I started out sort of wanting to get into that. You know, it really felt good, and I'm envious of every one of you. I'm proud of you, basically. But the trick to the whole thing will be to sell 
not what you are, but who you are. I guarantee you, if, if Dr. Ed Arana could shake that problem that happened to him recently after facing the dental boards and all of that, and he was back in practice, that I would follow him anywhere, would you? Yeah, yeah. you follow him anywhere. <laughs> follow him anywhere, right? You'd follow him anywhere. Why would you follow him anywhere? Because he stands on something. He's passionate. He believes in it. It's the right thing to do. Most of the people in this room, you know what I know about you. You haven't even told me who you are, what your name is. But most of you in here got past this thing about having to make a living, about, about that being the most important thing in your life. You finally got to the point where you want to do what's right. That's a whole big step. It's a big step. Doing what's right. You know, I want to mention the name of a fellow that's not here. I can always talk about people not here, right? They can't shoot you down nothing. But Dr. Dan Rosen, I, I'm, I'm so proud of him. He's been one of my students. And I've mentioned that because he's been my best student. You know what he did in 1991? He quit accepting any insurance. And if you got insurance, I tell you what, you can fill it out yourself, but he's not going to help it. You know why he did that? Because he wanted to do what's right. And do one, doing what's right goes beyond standard of care, doesn't it? It goes beyond what maybe dental insurance is going to pay for it. If you want to do a drill and fill thing, insurance pay for that real, right quick. If you're going to do what's right, if you're going to do what's been talked about in this room, you're going to have to think about something. And that is, begin considering the fact that you may have to go on a cash basis for state of the art. You're not, state of the art is a wonderful thing. That's putting into practice what is best known by the top people in the country, and that's who you are. Now, what Dan Rosen did, he was doing $160,000 every quarter when he met me. And after putting into practice what I taught him, he was doing 10000 a quarter. No, I just, I just try and see if you're awake. No, he moved it from 160000 to 300000 a quarter. Cash, not insurance. Now, how did that happen? How did that happen? Because they recognized in his office that Dan Rosen had their health, total health interest at heart. He was concerned totally with them. And you know what? When they saw that and they saw little things starting to improve in their health, do you know what? They were just like the people that would follow Ed Arana. They would follow Rosen wherever he went from that point forward. So I'm going to tell you this in a closing remark that I would suggest that you do. Remember the philosophy of simply marketing who you are and not so much what you are. In all of your communications, tell the people what you believe. Let them know what you believe. Everybody has a hero story. Did anybody, was anybody not here when I told this little story about myself? I mean, everybody has a little story about themselves. Everybody has one there is, and every client that you'll have, every patient has a story about themselves. And they want to know your story. And if you tell them your story, if you tell them half of what I know about you without really ever having a conversation with you, if you told them half about that, they would follow you anywhere you go. It doesn't matter. Whatever you suggest. And I, and, and I, I just think that this academy has an answer, and it's the right direction. The accreditation program is a wonderful idea. It's the way to go, and if we can get everyone to begin following in step with that, then the people of this academy are going to be the ones that wind up on top. Because when the curtain comes down and there are no more amalgam that people want, and they have to turn to somebody to set a new standard of care, who is it going to be? Is it going to be the ADA, the PDQ, or the IAOMT? Let's hear it for that. All right. Thanks. Well, I'll let you go to dinner. I, I understand that has been arranged for this evening.
Sam, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate those comments very much, Sam. Um, Terry Lee is putting on uh, up here the uh, address, phone number, and fax, and email. For those of you who feel that uh, this weekend has been valuable and would like to have some of your friends, colleagues, enjoy it as well, um, send some names. We'll send out our next announcement for our uh, spring meeting in March in Las Vegas to them. Uh, I think this has been a great meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank a few people very quickly. First of all, Wayne King and Mark Flack, who've spent the whole weekend audio and videotaping everything you've seen here. If you're like me, you probably don't understand everything you've heard. And um, the tapes, I understand that the audio uh, clarity on the videos as well as the audio tapes here is just immaculate. So if there's anything you didn't quite understand this weekend, order the tapes. And I want to thank them for the job they do. Secondly, I'd like to thank the exhibitors for uh, bringing all the information to us that they have. And uh, mostly, I wanted to thank all of the speakers. Uh, you guys and gals are what the meeting was about. And so again, one final round of applause for all of you. And finally, I wanted to thank our hosts, Jess and Laura Clifford for making it such a comfortable and wonderful weekend and arranging for the beautiful weather. So, Jess and Laura. We'll see all of you at dinner, and for those of you who won't be joining us, hopefully we'll see you in Las Vegas in March. Thanks so much. What? I believe the buses are coming at 545 to, to bring everyone to dinner. Thank you. <laughs>